speaker is uh, Mr. David Birwadkar. Uh, and he is presently an advisor and head of the Great Eastern Institute of Maritime Studies. Uh, before this, uh, David has had various ascending roles and vast experience in technical management and development of personnel as head of the, the uh, head of the technical team of Great Eastern. Uh, I will not get into more because I would rather we would rather hear David speak his thoughts rather than read his biodata. David, if you don't mind, I will stop here and we would rather listen to you. Please. No, no, please, please. I, I really don't want to be embarrassed. We have such uh, learned luminaries here that I, I will, will only be embarrassing me if you go on talking about my CV. So, so thank you so much. Um, first of all, my heartiest congratulations to the MTG for the 11th uh, anniversary. And I think it's a job well done. Lots to be done yet, but I'm sure they are on the right path and uh, we are all there to support you all. Uh, Dr. Malini Shankar, Dr. Vijay Jadong, uh, good afternoon. Uh, and I think excellent uh, presentations and speeches, very, very enlightening, very, very relevant. And I think a lot of takeaways from there for all of us uh, to implement, use, and also probably look at in retrospect and see what we can do to better the uh, maritime training systems, education, and how we have better uh, cadets coming out to going out to sea and then subsequently becoming better officers. Also, um, uh, good afternoon to all my panelists and ladies and gentlemen. So basically, uh, what I want to talk about is not something which uh, we all don't know. I mean, it's everybody knows, but the relevance of it cannot be denied. And also the fact that uh, we need not only one aspect of it, but every aspect of this to be fulfilled for really making maritime education um, uh, very successful or for making cadets uh, uh, coming out to be very good products so that uh, they, I mean, they man our ships and uh, with the highest level of competency. So, I mean, for me, uh, what, what determines that is the training institute with the requisite infrastructure, equipment, and of course, congenial atmosphere, a good course content duly developed over a period of time, and students with adequate core competency, basic knowledge, and a desire to learn. Of course, adequately qualified trainers who constantly enhance and enrich their knowledge and are adaptable to using modern teaching techniques along with traditional and time-tested ones. Because ultimately, we know that time-tested ones like practical training, uh, on-the-job training, etc., are very, very important. But uh, mixed with that, the new uh, what pandemic has taught us the online training, the use of the VR, the use of the rampant use of simulators. I think we all can profess that, that these are very, very effective means of training and can only enhance the traditional training techniques to make uh, the output much more better. Again, what is more important is for the ability of the trainer to ensure that what is taught is well grasped by the students. And because we know that a teacher can have all the credentials, but if the deliverance is not effective enough, then also we have failed in ensuring that that standard of teaching is of a high level. The trainer should always have a plan B, I, I think, in case plan A or the traditional methodology of teaching is not working. So that he should be able to get the pulse, you know, when he's teaching that, okay, are the students getting it, what he's teaching, 100%, 50%, 60%, whatever. And they'll probably be ready to adapt a new way of uh, teaching, which is to, to be in his grasp or which he should know that how it should be done. And most importantly, it is very essential the teacher is passionate about teaching and does not just teach merely as a profession. He should be loved. He loves, he should love teaching from the core of his heart. Let me talk a little bit more about passion. I mean, that's something which uh, is, uh, I think it's a very, very misguided kind of a norm given to things. But what is passion? Uh, it has a motivating factor. So it is significantly required for a high quality teaching. You know, passionate teachers, uh, they create effective learning environments. They endeavor to increase learning potential of the students. They make a huge difference regarding effective learning of the le learner. Passion based on commitment is at the heart of effective teaching as a, as a field. For this reason, passionate teachers can create excitement that uh, probably influences learning. The link between learning and education argues that all pedagogical uh, approaches fail unless passion is created in the classroom. What happens? Passionate uh, teachers, they like their job. Obviously, they're doing it because they love what they're doing and that's why they're there. And unlike some who are just there to take it as an alternate profession because they have already done enough, so they take it up as a job which will pay them money and 
probably let them carry on with their life uh, requirements or the routine requirements. So passion teachers, apart from liking the job, they are aware of the effect of passion on student success. The influence of passion for learning and teaching is absolutely indisputable. And for this reason, passionate teachers always put efforts to increase student achievement. I think the passionate teachers are the people who truly believe that teaching energizes them compared with those who have lost faith and put less effort in the job. An enthusiastic teacher, I think, can also encourage students and turn them into passionate individuals themselves to achieve more successful outcomes. Again, passionate teachers are very strongly committed to that work, and so they will keep on updating themselves. They'll keep on making sure that what they teach is effective, and also self-learning is, is a constant mode for them. And that automatically inspires the students and awaken the desire to learn. Uh, I think the second part is, of course, continuous development of academic and professional knowledge for a trainer. Continuous development uh, has the potential to expand individual skill sets, enhance knowledge retention, I think generate new ideas and perspectives, boost morale and raise overall performance. It can help in achieving career development goals, obtaining or updation of professional licenses or certification because that is also a requirement, explore new perspectives to approach work and maintain a marketable professional skill set. And then continuous development of knowledge is the process of acquiring new skills and knowledge continually over time. I think we can never say that we know enough and with whatever we have, we can teach. I think it's definitely required to continually uh, upgrade and upgrade our skills and uh, our knowledge set. Then learning new things gives us a feeling of accomplishment, which in turn boosts our confidence in our own capabilities. And acquiring new skills with un will unveil new opportunities and help to find innovative solutions to problems. Uh, and I think it also helps to develop both personally and professionally. And obviously, there is a scope for opening new opportunities so that you can achieve your full potential. I think the last aspect for me, which is important, is academic delivery quality check. Academic quality check is a way of describing how well the learning opportunities available to students help them to achieve their award. Like, you know, it is also making sure that appropriate and effective teaching, support, assessment, and learning opportunities are provided for them. In the field of education, the major quality indicators such as curriculum design, curriculum transaction, evaluation system, R&D, infrastructure and learning resources, student support and progression, organization and management, etc. have been identified. I think there is a lot more we can say about how we can check um, academic delivery, uh, but I, I think we can also do it as part of our discussions. So I think that's basically what I need to talk about saying that these are some things which are essential. to really have to look at how we can improve the quality of teaching and training in our maritime institutes. Thank you so much. I'm not going to give you a very straightforward answer. So allow me a couple of minutes to, to, to maybe, you know, uh, give it in a pers right perspective as I feel. Uh, you know, Training or teaching may be termed as, or rather is termed as a passionate profession. Passion comes first. That is so, so very <clears throat> important. And, and the employers, they simply cannot expect the, these gems, you know, the great teachers who have got the passion. Now, I'm already taking into account that those gems already have the domain knowledge that uh, Captain Yadav mentioned. But anything you may have, you know, but if you're not able to, uh, put it across, as uh, Jasjeet mentioned, how to do it, how to deliver, how to carry your, your participants, your students with you. The, the passion which I feel is that fire within you to motivate and bring the people along with you and learn together. That is what, in my opinion, the, the uh, thing is. But having such people, do we expect them to work for free? See, that's, a, that's a very big question. Oh, you're very passionate. I'm giving you an opportunity, right? You must be thankful to me. Rather, you should pay me because I'm giving you the opportunity to fulfill your passion. It doesn't work. If a person is passionate about it, if a per person knows that he is good in delivering what he's doing, he has an opportunity cost. He has other jobs. He has other people who, similar people who are employed elsewhere. So we need to look at two, three things very clearly. Number one, passionate teachers need to pay bills. Passionate people raise, need to raise children, have a family, buy saris for their wives. All right, all these things are so very important. 
however at the same time we need to have these people uh, to be compared with like to like other uh, similar employed you know uh, coming from the ship coming from other professions and work, working in our profession so i would say that yes a remuneration a reasonable remuneration not only that but also you need uh, yeah, recognition which is so very important if you if you take a master mariner or chief engineer and you make him the so called assistant professor or a lecturer in a university of course he is not going to like it why why should he be working for you if you are not paying that person sufficient why would he he look at his uh, you know equivalent superintendent or marine superintendent working elsewhere so that's another thing and third thing is for such people we must have a career plan a growth plan because now whatever teachers are there and whatever students are there they are not like us right we had an easier time compared to what these people are going to have you got so many disruptions coming up you got amazing amount of changes which are coming up we are talking about autonomous ships you are talking about digitalization decarbonization eexis and the cii's and these are this is only the beginning so it is so very important for our teachers to continue to grow that continuous development micro credit courses uh, cross faculty uh, training uh, cross functional training if you are you and me are working in one university you're teaching a subject as an a professor in a, another discipline i should be very free to go and sit in your class and learn from you i mean that openness that mindset like a green pasture of knowledge i think that is something uh, very very important sir thank you um, can i can add thank you this? yeah yeah please please do yeah so actually i'll touch on uh, basically both uh, the questions or uh, both the topics which we spoke about just now one is about you talking about uh, uh, selective teaching and you know, teaching subject or where you have domain expertise now let's look at a practical scenario okay most of the institutes are not really i am using you know they are the private institute from where products are coming out dg norms are 18 hours per week for teaching faculty uh, there is a number of hours and the course contents for every batches everybody works backwards saying that okay this guy can teach 18 hours the other faculty will teach 18 hours etc etc so how many how many faculty members do i need to make up my complement so okay 12 or 13 and that's how it works and then then we don't look at okay, he will teach this subject or he will teach that subject i think for that the thinking has to be changed overall uh, not only by us talking here but probably overall from the uh, from i think every in every every all the stakeholders i mean dg shipping government everybody will have to butt in to probably look at this aspect because it's serious as well if you say 18 hours people are doing it that way that they, 18 hours allowed okay let me use him to the maximum i don't care whether his domain knowledge is nautical egg desk or um, 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 ship ship i um, mean uh, what do you call it, the practical training of ship, uh, you know ship building or whatever so, is there yeah. and it all it all is uh, uh, used that okay he knows to he can teach the subject he is qualified to teach the subject let us do that secondly when you talk about remuneration and for passionate teachers uh, i i first of all I, let me be humble by saying that i don't know how many passionate teachers are really there in the industry who are actually teaching at the moment we find most of them are uh, a lot where they are 60 plus uh, because dg allows up to 70 years of age uh, they come they they are agreeable to come at a very very competitive price so if people are running a com uh, commercial setup as a, as a institute then they are going to take them rather than prefer the the passionate ones because ultimately what happens is that uh, they look at it also as a, if not a profit making at least a self sustaining institute not uh, having to given money from the parent company or whatever so so that is something which uh, has to be looked at overall whether the incentives can be given by government for all these things etc etc so then actually then the salaries can be increased because otherwise what happens i will tell you benchmarking is done okay this institute is doing better because they are getting those uh, professors at this at this level or faculty at this level let me pay a little bit more and get them so it's not really about paying them or enhancing their career because again in teaching how much can a career be enhanced there is very limited you can go from as as jagmeet says maybe cross faculty maybe cross functional but or go to vice principal principal head of the institute there is very little you can has scope as promotion basis i mean unlike a corporate or a shipping company itself 
so that are all the challenges which are there whereby i though we would want to have uh, passionate teachers but to get them there is a whole lot of process change which will have to ha happen to basically achieve that thank you um thank you david uh, you know that thought actually bring me a thought we see so many advertisements attracting i'm very careful in using the word gullible to the merchant navy you know you will become a captain in 10 years and you will earn 10000 dollars etc with a beautiful cruise ship and uh, we see these advertisements why is it that we don't see any advertisements for attracting faculty i'm very again the word is attracting faculty not advertising for faculty we don't see that well, why where is the industry failing in that so i'll just uh, start the uh, maybe with 30 seconds and then i'll leave it uh, where is the industry failing in it is when people want to come ashore they definitely look around what's going on and a uh, couple of talks with some friends they will have and they will come to know hey how much you get paid for doing this are you doing it part time or full time are you a contract professor or a full time professor so that itself the word of mouth and the practical situation which is going on either it can act as a deterrent or it can act as a promotion so i i hope i have answered your question in the few few seconds that i wanted to thank you thank Mr. you captain nigam has his hand up sir captain yes, nigam has his hand up i have seen that i'm i will go to him but uh, this specific subject because he hand had the hand up when i started the question so i think it is not about this question but yes captain nigam please go ahead uh, thank you sir now i just wanted to add uh, to some of the challenges with mr david raised and i have noted that them them down and point wise i'll answer because uh, i may have a solution to those challenges the first one was working backwards about 18 hours and extracting the maximum out of the person as per the allowed 18 hours so whether usko subject padhana aata hai ya nahi aata usko subject pakda diya to bhi 18 ghante tumko pure karne and that will justify your salary there is a solution to this uh, without taking name let us let me say that i have a engineer in engineering faculty and today i am doing only bsc nautical science course so that engineering faculty may be limited to teaching stability or ship construction however that and that works out to maybe only 12 hours however if he is assigned some multitasking like a qhsc manager that justifies his salary so multitasking introduction of multitasking because there are so many other things other than teaching when a institute is being run so uh, that is one uh, solution which i can recommend the other is whether you know that person can teach in navigation or stability or construction and you are just loading him in with it why not try it out transfer it out uh, master marine certificate of competency he has done all the subjects and he has passed in all the functions similarly a chief engineer has done meo class 1 as he has passed in all the subjects maybe he doesn't like to teach navigation maybe he likes to teach meteorology maybe he likes to teach general ship knowledge so uh, as a head of the institution it is our duty to extract first of all to explore the talent and then to extract whatever maximum you can take from that person in a passionate way which he can deliver the third question you said was there is very limited scope of promotion in teaching sir um, i beg to differ here there is a lot of scope in this particular uh, training profession provided we step into r and d when we go into research and development when we are writing books when we are patenting our what whatever we have found there is lot of development there is international exposure which we have not yet tested but i can see it in the university where i work how teachers have progressed how they go on international tours how they are paid in dollars when they go to inter for international tours how they get international recognitions 
and they are visiting professors in so many other universities, including Dr. Jadav, who is there with us. So there is a lot of scope. Thank you so much, sir. Can I, can uh, I just uh, 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 respond a little bit? Not respond, but may probably add on to what you said. Yes, sir. Uh, Captain uh, Nigam, I absolutely, I totally agree with what you said. And in fact, that's the way it should be going forward. But the thing is that it's not done that way. Now you look at it's 18 hours. A total 40 hours per week are being done by the um, faculty members, right? Eight, 18 hours is teaching and then there are other hours because 8 hours per day into 5 is 40 hours. So then the other other time, 22 hours is where they, he works as a QHC manager and does other things, assessment, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's how it is squeezed. I'm, I'm, I'm just giving the practical aspect of things, how it happens there and not really about how it should be done because I agree that it should be done this way but that's the way it is done and that's the issue which I'm trying to raise rather than saying that uh, I mean uh, uh, it's the right way to do it so that's that's something which I thought I will I will highlight and also if you mentioned that about that uh, this um, uh, what you, second was about that passion right you said that uh, uh, transferring the exploring the potential yeah no, the so potential. I, again there I was mentioning that it in a particular institute say if you're continuing the same institute like R&D, R&D requires a lot of capital to be put in. Now, how many companies really they, uh, agree, uh, happy to put it there? I know two institutes in Maharashtra who are doing it. I know Samudra does it, Tolani is doing it. And uh, in fact, IMEA is supporting Tolani in that. Uh, now recently they have signed an MOU. So uh, again, I mean, I'm not going to get into real lot of details, but uh, even we have looked at that, but they said, what are you going to gain from it? Are we going to get a good branding? Are we going to get good exposure? What's going to happen? Is it going to help us uh, make products which are, we can be patented and use on our ships? So, you know, everybody looks at the commercial aspect rather than looking at R&D as something which can enhance the knowledge of the faculty also, the, the students also, et cetera, et cetera. What I'm saying is that the thinking needs to be changed rather than, uh, I mean, there are avenues available, but the, the thinking is not there at the moment. That's the issue. Thank you. Is uh, it? I, I think Dr. I, uh, Mangi Shankar that... has got a lot of views on this. She, I have spoken to her <laughs> before on this. And oh, okay, rightly enough, she has raised her hand also. Go ahead, ma'am. Uh, I'm just going to respond to, first of all, to the need, you know, looking for money. I think if you're looking for money, just don't look at teaching. Just don't look at teaching. Because this is about molding young minds. This is about making contribution to the sector. Uh, this is like, you know, when you get into the civil services, if you're looking at money, just stay out of it. Um, I'm going to share one small experience of what you should be looking for. Um, as DG shipping, I, I, I remember, uh, you know, there were, there were hurdles to my, actually, uh, I should have been in London representing the country in the IMO, but there were hurdles there. So I sat down and looked at the you know, e-governance part of it as to how to hasten the ease of doing business for the seafarer uh, in terms of uh, you know, um, uh, how easily they can get, for example, the COC renewed. So this was behind, we, we had to do a lot of hard work, which never gets recognized. So there is no money and there is no recognition. Okay, Very many fields are like that. It's only the corporate field where you get both money and recognition perhaps. But then I had to fly down to Chennai for a personal visit. It was a condolence visit. Uh, and, uh, and I remember somebody coming to me and saying in that, in that meeting, in, in, in that milieu, and saying, you don't know me, but I know you. I'm a seafarer in, who's serving in Andamans and Nicobar. And uh, what used to, the COC renewal used to take a huge number of visits and time. I had to go to the M MMD, then I had to take uh, go to the syndicate bank. I had to uh, pay the money, then I had to take you know, and several visits of uh, uh, pursuing the case. It says now I've got it in seventy-two hours flat, and I think I'd like to really appreciate what DG Shipping is doing. Now that is your recognition. Mr. Makkar, that is the recognition. It will never be money in this sector. It will perhaps recognition in terms of awards might come once in a while, but um, there are many fields, and this is one of them where you have to look at what you, you know, what uh, what is recognition, what is satisfaction, what is uh, a reward. The second point I'd like to make very shortly is, you know, the number of hours of teaching. It's like you know, in an office. Um, you can sit in office for nine hours and do nothing in an administrative office. 
you can teach 18 hours and nothing goes through to the student. It's not, it's number of hours is important because that is a parameter that is stressed upon by regulations, right? But what you transmit and how you transmit in that 18 hours is what is more important. And I have seen teachers brilliantly doing that. And there are teachers, I've, I'm talking from my own experience, which I remember from my college days, where teachers would come sit on a high school and actually read out the textbook. If you're going to do that, then there is no transmission of knowledge and you can teach for 50 hours and still not get anything. And then there were other teachers who said, okay, I, I still remember the teacher saying, this is the curriculum syllabus we'll cover during this semester, but I will cover only 50% and you shall cover 50%. You meant all of us students in high school. So we used to go and sit in the British Council Library, which was an excellent source, and say, okay, if I am going to sit and stand on the podium and teach my own classmates, which is actually more challenging than teaching your students, then you come up with, you, you actually do extra work. So the teacher is not doing that kind of work. It can be logged in as teaching because they're definitely guiding, but you are doing the learning. And this was 35 years ago in school. Now, those are the kind of things that I would expect a teacher in today's world to adapt, adopt, and implement. If you're still looking at just classroom teaching, we will not be going very far ahead. The learning process can be uh, stimulated, um, you know, uh, uh, guided by very many different methods. And that's where the teachers are uh, perhaps uh, lacking this thing. Uh, a third point, and I'll stop here, is perhaps this is this is just uh, you know uh, I, I'm just doing a um, thinking, lot thinking is when a teacher uh, teaches the high up to school level, they go through a BA program, however good or however weak that program is, they are taught the principles of teaching. You know how do you address the students, what kind of methods do you use, but we do not have any regulated courses. Uh, for as teaching college students, for teaching higher education students. Maybe that's where MPT can step in and form a, have a framework where you say, okay, let's step in and see what are the pedagogic methods that are available because a, a teacher might be, you know, better at delivering a case study rather than doing classroom teaching. Somebody might be uh, doing classroom teaching better. Um, and then the last point is evaluation. I find that the method of evaluation testing and evaluation is primitive. I'm sorry, I'm making a considered statement. It's quite primitive, which means I will put something into your head during the classroom and you take it and put it out on the exam paper at the end of it. And, and then you can ask our fellow industry people how they fare in the interviews. I don't have to elaborate on that. That is what we have to break. Get them to think, get them to think critically and contribute. So number of, uh, because I started with money, recognition, number of hours is, ne is, is necessary, but not sufficient. I can go on on this, but I'll stop. <laughs> uh, Ma'am, uh, when we started with this topic, we knew this was a hot topic uh, mm -hmm. and that it will involve and uh, it will invoke a number of responses and a number of uh, varied uh, responses that too. Uh, the, the fact also one of the challenges which was expressed earlier has been the huge gap in demand and supply that you can make a lot of rules if if you have a lot of people doing that. But if you make a lot of rules and nobody comes in, then it defeats the purpose of making the rules. So uh, we have to be careful in that. At the same time, I think we have missed out on mentioning one thing, that the institutes, when they are set up, they write the mission and vision document only to satisfy somebody, but not necessarily to actually meet those objectives. And they need to do that. And somewhere the audit must must catch that. Captain Nigam, I know you're shaking your head. <laughs> I will give you a list of institutes which do know nothing of the sort. So let's not get into this. And you know I'm talking from position of knowing what I'm saying and not I'm just not shooting in the dark. Maybe your institute doesn't do that. 
and you gave examples of that i would like to draw your attention to a document which is it's a gazette notification published which says that if you are an assistant professor professor and you want to move up in life what are the targeted achievements it lists out the number of hours the number of papers that have to be published the subjects in which they have to be published the number of lectures you have to attend as a teacher outside the university uh, curriculum it states all of that and frankly if you follow all of that you will have a good teacher because finally it's a product so you will have one that is certainly there i want to ask the organizers one thing we are already at 10 past 1 and our event was supposed to be 1 1100 hours to 1300 hours should we should we continue because i have a question here yes sir we can continue for another 10 minutes okay i can i have i have a question here from mr one. natarajan natarajan yes. yes that's i was Ar about to say arvin natarajan he has raised his hand so can somebody unmute arvin please oh, there he is yes please go ahead and keep it as a question you can't be unmuted one minute i think you are unmuted no you can unmute him let I, me try I, i can't i could not uh, goshan can you unmute yes sir i just unmute everyone No, no. Okay, okay. Here's a new. Yes, Arvind. Hello, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, giving me the uh, the opportunity. Uh, I I just wanted to second uh, the views expressed uh, by Arvind. Uh, sorry to butt in. First, introduce yourself, please. Right. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, my name is Arvind Natarajan, and uh, I'm working with the International Chamber of Shipping in uh, in London. and uh, i represent uh, ship owners at the imo uh, during the maritime safety committee and and maritime environment protection committee uh, i represent ship owners at the imo uh, at, at that level i wanted to express my uh, uh, opinion about what captain negam and dr shankar has said uh, firstly uh, teaching uh, remuneration in teaching can never ever uh compare with uh, an active uh, seafaring career it it cannot do that so if my suggestion is if teachers are thinking that uh, they would get that kind of remuneration it's not teaching is not for that that person i would rather suggest that uh, uh perhaps a slow transition into into, into teaching so active seafarers during holidays between ship tours can uh, come in for guest lecturing and 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 that can enhance uh, teaching skills so i i actually uh, personally i had done that when i was uh, a guest lecturer at masa academy and also at ari so these two academies gave me this opportunity but uh, for some reason this is not being advertised much it's not it's it's not being promoted as as an option and uh, the second thing i wanted to say i i agree with captain what captain negam said there is fabulous career progression available in in uh, teaching uh, because of my experience in teaching uh, at masa and ari i got the opportunity to teach in the uk in a maritime university in the uk and further it gave me an opportunity to work at the imo uh, as well so that that was possible only because i started teaching it was definitely not because of my seafaring career so def there is there is progression and finally just a small personal uh, anecdote uh, i was approaching a deep water anchorage at fujaira those i think everybody uh, understands yes. that fujaira is a deep water anchorage and uh, i had lowered my anchor and uh, i reported to the port control uh, as master of the ship that i, I, I had uh, uh, lowered anchor at, at the within the port limits and out of the blue somebody on the vhf contacted me and ask me am i is it, is this captain speaking so i said yes uh, it it is so i said uh, well sir i recognized your 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 unmistakable uh, voice on the vhf and uh, you taught me stability many years ago and i just wanted to thank you for uh, for the uh, the the learning experience that you gave me and i think to me that was invaluable there is no money value you can put to that so uh, that is that is the best thing about uh, teaching Uh, you know out of the blue you might get uh, some kind of experience which 
which reinforces the fact that uh, yes, teaching is a great profession. It just needs to be promoted better. Thank you. Just to quickly answer you, Captain Arvind, uh, just as you were teaching when you were sailing at Massa Academy, it's a reasonable norm. Uh, it is there. And uh, though naturally due to certain restrictions, such numbers are not very high because it starts with the passion, uh, which was also expressed that you can't have anybody walking in and teaching. It doesn't work like that. So, so it is there. Okay. Um, Okay, we have a number of hands up and I think Viraf is there and uh, Jagmeet is there after that. And I think after that, we need to stop because we are reaching the end of our, our timing. Viraf, please. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, 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 Madam, uh, Dr. Malini Shankar, sorry, this is going to be a little bit of a, as uh, the senior said, stirring up a hornet's nest and a view contrary to yours. But this is the problem that the market has a perception that teacher remuneration, particularly, uh, and I will like to repeat what Captain Nigam sir said, that teacher remuneration is, you know, at the bottom rung of shore, uh, shore uh, remuneration, shore base uh, oh, jobs. remuneration. Yeah. It is not uh, actual, factual. And uh, of course, I have a bit of an advantage that, uh, my employers are a ship management company, but I can assure you that our team, uh, when it comes to pay slips, are uh, standing toe to toe with any other uh, department in, uh, you know, a large ship management company managing 600 ships. But there is a methodology on which the team has achieved this. And as Captain Nigam said, that you have to showcase the value of the team. Now, showcasing the value in notional terms in a classroom is amazing. And a lot of trainers do that. And we would, you know, uh, we would be proud as an industry to say that we have been instrumental in preventing accidents, uh, preventing operational losses, etc. But that's all notional. It's difficult to measure. It's like trying to measure how many people did not die because they were wearing seat belts. Uh, what we have tried to achieve and it's it's been a decade uh, and we just want to you know share this example is at a very early stage we realized that while learning how to teach like this we were managing to be uh, you know head and shoulders above the rest above out at you. sea yes. and when that head and shoulders was not just the ows we suddenly realized that uh, we are better than shore based technicians uh, we are giving solutions with the manufacturer authorized uh, technician is not providing. Now that translated in giving a backend service, which involved uh, not just operational assistance to our vessels, but also consultancy on fitment of Agdis to ship owners. Uh, today, uh, we can proudly say that there are times when uh, a vessel writes to a, to a large organization uh, making multiple equipment other than like this, and you get a docket number. And before the docket number arrives, we give a remote solution to the vessel. Now imagine what is the quantifiable benefits of it. There are times where we've given solutions which would require a technician to fly down, charge for the logistics, fly down to South America. If he made it to that port, uh, would charge by the hour in euros and dollars. And we are talking about large sums of money. We are talking about making sure a vessel does not get detained in Australia at times, not because the OW has not understood the problem, but in fact, the PSCO has not understood uh, elements of the EGDIS and they genuinely want to learn. We've interacted with them and then they've come across and said, oh, sorry, we misinterpreted the performance standards wrongly. Thank you for enlightening us. We do that for DNV. We do that for class NK. We have added value in a measurable way. And that has allowed our team to have remuneration, uh, you know, matching and in cases exceeding our peer departments also. So it's a question of uh, redesigning, reinventing uh, maritime education and training, going outside the classroom confines uh, and showing the commercial value, being self-sustaining, uh, 
Today, a classic example is online training on cloud simulators. There is no limit to where we have our faculty from. We could have one in Dehradun. It does not have to be from Nera, uh, Navi Mumbai. She can be somebody sitting overseas as long as the faculty does not have the time zone issue. So there is an, when you introduce technology, when you think out of the box, you can not just be, uh, you know, operationally viable, you can be commercially viable and have the wages in. Yep. So basically the head of the institutions or the managers have to think in those lines. Be, you have to, be, there should be openness. They have to think this way. Not uh, think about their teachers. See, the teacher engagement uh, job just as we talked about student development, um, and I think Dr. Jadho very categorically expressed that, that uh, it has to move to outcome-based and uh, student-centric rather than teacher-centric. But the teacher-centric also involves uh, teacher engagement. And um, it finally may be hand-in-glove with what Jagmeet and David said about passion. You see, what Chirag just now explained was, I think, a lot of passion uh, with, with which he expressed the expertise that they have developed. And it hasn't happened overnight. There must have been a lot of trips and falls uh, when by, to reach that uh, level. Uh, I think um, Madam Shankar, Dr. Shankar yeah. wants to after, comment. After, after Madam Shankar, give me 30 seconds. Yeah. One clarification regarding the remuneration. It is while it is true that when a person uh, enters as assistant professor, the, the remuneration is actually quite low, uh, and that is the way it is structured. It is not so low when it goes to associate professor and professor. I've had discussions with the industry people on this. In fact, when you go to associate professor, it matches a uh, parallel course that you would hold on an offshore uh, on a short job. So let us not uh, look at it. And and there are you you it's a trade off. You know you're at home, you're with family, uh, and uh, there are, like every choice, there's a trade off. But what I would like to appeal to the forum of this MTG is that we do need people to get into academics part time or full time. If we want to, you know, because we, we say we want seafarers, so 12, 20% seafarers to be Indian, and you know, so many um, ambitious statements. But if we don't get the right people getting into academics, as I said, part time or full time, I, I don't see a very bright future for the Indian seafarers. I, and that's not a, I'm looking at a positive note of uh, trying to see, get people into academics rather, or, or training and education, both. Because it can't be training, also cannot be perfunctory training. It has to come with a certain knowledge, passion that the panelists have spoken about. And after all, we, you know, we're talking about demand and supply. I don't think, you look at 2 lakhs, I think now we have 2.2 lakhs, 2.5 lakh active seafarers, and we are not looking at more than 100 people who should come into training. Look at the minuscule proportion we are looking at. I think uh, she's muted herself, I think. Um, I said, I, I, that's all I wanted to share because we're running oh, out okay. of time. So I, I don't want to <laughs> yes. you know, dwell on this for much longer. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Uh, can we have uh, Jagmeet's comments? And I think that we yeah. will call um, it a day after that. I think, yeah, I think uh, Dr. Malini Shankar, uh, she said it so very well to, to end it. And I would like to leave it at that. Except that I would like to answer to Arvind. First of all, Arvind, it was good meeting you in London in April during the meeting at ICS. Uh, I just want to clarify to you when I was talking about, you know, the, the, the remuneration, there is no way I, which I mentioned was what you're getting on the ship, you should get in the colleges. All right. Yeah, so that, that has been very nicely, very properly clarified by Viraf as well as Dr. Malini Shankar that it has to be the shore based the comparison has to be with shore based opportunities and uh, with regards to the assistant professor or the lecturer thing that i talked about uh, definitely what i am saying and i'm very strong views i have about it if you have a masters and chief engineers with x number of years of experience 
of course we need them we realize at the same time that uh, a good trainer can add a lot of value to the students who can add a lot of value to the industry and overall we can help achieve the goal which are set in the MIV 2030 and MIV 2047. I mean, this is extremely, extremely uh, important and the supply and demand situation is quite critical. If we want to move ahead, we have to do uh, in, in a way that is practical. And uh, thank you, uh, uh, Malini ji for, for clarifying it. Thanks. Okay, um, all good things must uh, come to an end. Though we have had views from from one swing of the pendulum at one end to the other end, um, but I'm sure that there is a median path and uh, passion, the love for teaching, and sensible remuneration. I think they all go, will all contribute towards development of uh, faculty. But I will leave it at that. However, I think I will define one simple word because we use the word profession, professional here a number of times. And I recall that the Nautical Institute published a book called The History of Nautical Institute many years back. And that was one book which actually defined what is a professional. And I have not been able to find it anywhere else or come across it. And that book actually said, what is a professional? A professional is a person who practices a profession. And what is that profession? Profession is something that requires a certain amount of training, education and skills, which is formal in nature. It would require certain amount of certification at the end of it. And finally, it must bring benefit to the society. So actually, our profession does all of that and more, if, if not. So, I with with these words, I would like to hand back to our master of ceremonies, Viraf, with all the fancy money that he probably gets paid. <laughs> so, over to you, Viraf. So, just for the record, I drive a Tata Nano, sir. <laughs> but that's out of choice. <laughs> so, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Captain Halbe, sir, and all the panelists. And moving along quickly, uh, bearing in mind that we have half an hour overshot the limit, but I'm sure none of the participants mind that. Uh, may I request uh, Captain Kamal Chatta, sir, uh, uh, media partner for Maddox and uh, also an excellent uh, online host to take over the final um, vote of thanks uh, duties. Thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, thank you, Viraf. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Captain Yadav spoke about backbenchers in the class, and uh, he mentioned that uh, teachers often target uh, or, or should be targeting kids in the, in the backbenches because uh, they probably need the most attention uh, from, uh, you know, uh, from various uh, points of view. Um, however, I used to be a backbencher in, in the uh, initial years of my school and I realized that it was not a good place to sit because the teachers targeted you. So I conveniently, conveniently started sitting in the first bench amongst all the jewels of my class over there, despite being of a very modest academic brilliance. Uh, but today I find, uh, yes, I'm uh, repeating the same. I'm again uh, sitting um, uh, in this uh, uh, class of uh, brilliant uh, people of uh, uh, maritime academics and training. And uh, yes, I repeated what I used to do as a kid. Thank you so much. It's uh, an honor to be uh, delivering this word of thanks. Uh, uh, on behalf of the entire Maritime Trainers Guild, the founder president, Captain Pravat Nigam, the vice president, Dr. Surinder, and the MTG event organizing committee, I, Kamal Chadda, general secretary of MTG, have the honor and pleasure to deliver this vote of gratitude on the 11th foundation day of the Maritime Trainers Guild. My sincere thanks to the very gracious and highly acclaimed Dr. Malini Shankar, 
who has taken time out to speak to us and stay with us right through the event, which is uh, very, very nice of you, madam, uh, because there's uh, many uh, we know who would not bother hanging around uh, till the end. Uh, she has honored us time and again with her presence and once again impressed her with her astute observations and suggestions. Thank you so much, ma'am. <clears throat> the presenting speaker, our gracious thanks to you, Dr. Vijay Jano, for an eye-opening talk on outcome-based education. Special thanks to Captain Shiv Halbe, CEO of MASA, for so brilliantly conducting the panel discussion. He brought out so many aspects and some very humorously and some, of course, very seriously. He brings out a great mix. Uh, the panelists, uh, Mr. David Birwarkar, uh, Captain Mahesh Yadav, Jagmeet Makkar, Jasjeet Suri, they have all impressed us with the impactful thoughts on the subject of trainers and training. Thank you so much, gentlemen. The organizing committee have been working for over a month to put this event together, the ever supportive in the committee and deserving of a very special mention are Mr. S.M. Rai and Captain M.M. Saki. And a sincere thanks to all the others as well. And they, all the others know who they are. So I'll just, uh, won't bother with the names. They're always there and they're always uh, very, very supportive. Uh, thanks so much, Captain Viraj Ch uh, Chichgar for managing so astutely the ceremonies and adding your own unique flair to the introductions. Our gratefulness to the media for providing pre and post event publicity. Team Marix has taken care of the publicity design and artwork. A very important word of thanks to Ms. Delphine and her designer team. At uh, Chitkara University, we have had great support from Dr. Gulshan Dillon and the tech team there, a sincere thank you. I hope I have not missed anyone. My apologies if I have, but thank you all and have a very pleasant lunch and a very nice weekend. Bye-bye. Uh, before we go for lunch, can we all switch on our cameras for the picture? Gulshan, you're there? Yes, sir. You can switch on your camera too. So uh, I see there are about five screens. So how do you want to go about it? You can do it. You can shift screens and take pictures. Yes, sir. I will. Okay. Please go ahead. While she's taking taking pictures just for your information. At the peak, we had 135 attendees and about on an average 100 continued till the end. And by today's webinar standards, I think it's good. It's very good. Thank you so much, everyone. The picture is taken. Thank you so much for joining this. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's Thank go you. for lunch. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Bye-bye.